Good morning, everyone. Would you stand with us as we begin our time of worship today, singing, Lord, I need you. Christ is risen. Christ is risen Throughout history, you have gathered your people around your word to instruct them. I pray that you continue to open that vision to us, that we may be transformed by the renewing of your word in our hearts. What we have set aside for our own kingdoms, God, I pray that we can lay down to build your kingdom. We willingly and joyfully, sacrificially dedicate ourselves to you as an act of worship. In your name we pray, amen.
be seated. Good morning, everyone. I've got to use this today. My name is Justin LaRosa, and I'm the minister of the downtown Portico campus, and I want to welcome you here to this worship experience today. We are grateful that you're here. If you have any questions, please mark it down on this little connection card. Or uh, if you want to know anything about our community, we are a community of faith that gathers together, not just to uh, gather for gathering's sake. To, we're called to make God's love real, to go out, take the thoughts that we have about God, come together and make God's real out in the community, make God's love real. So 
Uh, just a couple of announcements today for you. First of all, there's a connection card in front of you. Please pull it out and write your name on it. Circle the service that you're in. And if you don't know, it's 11 Magnolia that we're in. And on the back, there's a place where you can put your prayer requests. And uh, just mark them in, throw it in the offering plate. And we pray over those every Tuesday. And so we're thinking about you and we're staying connected with you in that way. And we'd love for you to do that. A couple of other announcements. Uh, tonight is a pretty exciting night. How many of you have youth? There's one person. He's actually kind of a big boy now. He's, he's like more of an adult. But yeah, so I'm going to take this off because I can't really even hear myself. So tonight at 6 p.m., there's a confirmation service. Confirmation service is the time at which um, youth confirm their commitment to Christ and make a decision for themselves to kind of ongoing this lifelong journey of discipleship. So at 6 o'clock in the sanctuary, we'd love for you to join us. Next week, uh, the, the rest of the services are going to be a little bit different. They're children's musical, but this service will be the same. So it will be the same format for that. Last but not least, uh, do we have that little video gimmick? Uh, yeah, oh, look at that. Wow. So there's a... a that's not what I expected, but that, I like that. That is what I did expect. So we have this new website that just rolled out. It's called theportico.org. We would love for you, number one, to like it on Facebook, but to check it out, there's a, a bunch of different ways you can uh, uh, discover. That's the campus. That's our second campus downtown, and there's, it's, there's an events page with all the different kind of cool stuff going on. We have meditation uh, twice a week. And actually upcoming, we have Roger leading a documentary film and then an urban art mart on a Saturday, May 9th. And we'd love for you to be a part of that. So uh, if you want to know more about the downtown campus, uh, talk to me or write on your connection card. I want to know more and we'll reach out to you. So now we're going to transition from announcements to something called a prayer of confession. Do any of you know what that is? Prayer of confession, besides, you know, confessing. But um, does anyone know why we do it in the service? Anyone willing to take a risk and raise their hand and uh, say why we do it? Wow, this is an engaging group. <laughs> hello, hello. Any, oh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> You must be a former Catholic. Episcopalian, Episcopalian close enough. Smells and bells. Uh, yes. So honestly, we do a prayer of confession. Like sin is that charged up word, right, that everyone hears the word sin and they get all. But sin is what constricts our connection with God. And so when we do a prayer of confession in the service, it's this way to kind of just say, God, you, we know that you know, and now that you know, and we know we're confessing it, and it kind of just opens up that flow. And so I'm going to give you just 10 seconds to just share if there's anything you want to confess to God, and then we're going to do a prayer of confession in unison. So go ahead and bow your head, and if there's anything you need to share with God, this is your chance. Let's do the prayer of confession together. It should be up on the screen. Gracious God, you have walked patiently with us on our journeys. You have celebrated our successes and our growing understanding of your love. And you have mourned our failures and rejections of your healing mercy. This day, as we gather to celebrate the joy of Easter, let us remember that we will become Easter people, the people in resurrection, People who know that what was thought to be impossible has been conquered. Forgive our stubbornness and fears. Fill us with your healing love and help us to become the disciples that you need us to serve in the world. We ask this in the name of the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, you can hold your head up high and know that you are forgiven. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are forgiven. So as forgiven people, we're going to stand up and introduce ourselves to one another. But 
As you know, in this new series, we've been asking each other some questions, and it's some of the answers to that was last week hanging on that little, whatever that thing is, hanging down there. And uh, so you should have re received one of these as you were walking in. And so the question that we're inviting you to wrestle with during this time and during this service is, I want you to imagine Hyde Park's nets being filled You'll understand why we ask that question when you hear the scripture. And what does that look like for you? Go introduce, to some, introduce yourself to somebody you don't know. Pass the peace, brothers. Hear the word of God from John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised, raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Good morning. For those of you I have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Danny Bennett. I'm one of the pastors here at Hyde Park United Methodist. And more often than not, I am found here in this particular service. As Justin said earlier, if you have any questions, you can see him after service. I'll be right up here at the end of the service. You can find and see me as well. I'd love to meet you. I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. As we have gathered into this place of worship today, let us take time to center our hearts and direct our minds and attentions toward God. Let us pray. God of everlasting grace and mercy, this morning, we invite your Holy Spirit into this place. Open our eyes that we may see you more clearly, our ears that we may hear your voice. Open our hearts that we might be drawn closer to you. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So five months ago, I started a journey. 
It's a journey that has taken me over 600 miles and through three pairs of shoes. I started training the week of Thanksgiving to run the Gasparilla Ultra Challenge. It's 30 miles, over four races, over two days. Now, there were times when I started training that I doubted if I could accomplish such an ambitious goal. After all, I hadn't taken exercise seriously since high school, and my waistline showed the evidence of that. But the weekend of the race came, and I surprised myself. I crossed the finish line not once, not twice, but all four times, and I completed this challenge. I was absolutely ecstatic. My legs, however, were a little less enthusiastic. Every muscle in my legs howled in protest, trying to finish that last race. But I had done it. I had met a lofty goal. I felt like I was on top of the world. But Monday came after the races, and I was left with a question. What now? I'd met the goal that was set in front of me. I'd accomplished something that I didn't know that I could do. But there was no goal beyond the Gasparilla weekend. And there was a large part of me that felt that I had earned a break. So Monday came, and I took a day off. Tuesday came, I took a day off, and a couple of days turned into a couple of more. And before I knew it, I had reverted back to an old mode of being. Now, don't get me wrong, I am still very interested in athletics in general. I can spend hours watching it on the TV. <laughs> We've all experienced moments of excitement and joyful achievement in our lives. These mountaintop experiences leave us feeling like we're on top of the world. Maybe it's a completion of a long and challenging project at work. Maybe it's a well-earned promotion. Maybe it's achieving some new personal goal or mastering some new proficiency. Maybe it's an exciting development in your family that has brought a sense of great joy. But following the joy and the ecstasy of the mountaintop, there is an inevitable question that follows. That question is, what now? This was true for the disciples of Jesus following his death and resurrection. They had been on this real emotional roller coaster with his arrest and crucifixion, their deepest hopes had been dashed and their greatest fears had come to life. It felt like their world had come to an end. But then, on Easter Sunday, they were met with a new reality. It brought great joy. It was none other than Jesus, risen from the dead, who met Mary Magdalene in the garden, and the disciples in the room locked away in fear, and Thomas in his doubt. And each time he appeared, we're told they were overjoyed. Yet the joy seems to fade rather quickly. In the very next chapter, we find the disciples sitting and waiting. The tension's thick. They seem unsure of what to do, perhaps needing some time and space to assimilate everything that they had experienced. After all, the recent events surely had shaken them to their very core. Quite honestly, it would have been enough to shake anyone. After the whirlwind of events with such a joyful ending, they were left feeling emotionally drained and unsure of what to do next or where to go. It's not hard to imagine that the disciples gathered together asking themselves the question, what now? Others have faced this very same question. John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Movement, went through just such a period in his own life. With excitement and determination, he had set out on a grand mission for God. It would have been this emotional high, this mountaintop experience for him. 
But then, suddenly and unexpectedly, there came a moment when he felt he did not have the faith to continue. On a frightful sea voyage, when death stared him straight in the face, he was consumed with fear, and his faith was of little comfort to him. His friend Peter Bowler counseled him to preach faith until you have it. And Wesley tried this. He led a prisoner to Jesus by preaching faith in Christ alone. The prisoner found new life in God. But Wesley still found himself struggling in his own faith and even more frustrated seeing this man turned around into a new life in just such a short time. There arose for him in his heart this cry of, What now? When we're on an emotional high, we can feel like we're on top of the world. But then in moments of frustration and uncertainty that often follow those moments, we can easily revert to old ways. And so it was for the disciples. They found themselves uncertain of where to go or what to do in this new way of life that was ushered in by the resurrection Jesus had introduced. So they wait for as long as they can. Peter is the first to break the silence. Unable to wait any longer and desperate to do something, he turns to what is comfortable, what is familiar to him. Peter returns to his old way of life, and as I read the words of John 21, I could almost hear the frustration in his voice. That's it! I'm not sure of what else to do. I've had it. I'm going fishing. At least I know I can do that. So six other disciples are quick to respond in kind. And they join Peter and go out on the water. They spend the night fishing. It's honestly not a bad way to spend an evening. But with all their collective skill, by the time morning comes, they find their nets empty unable to catch a thing. Imagine their disappointment. Imagine their despair. Not even their old way of life was working for them anymore. The question, what now, would have screamed within them with a fresh and terrifying force. But thankfully, the night of fishing without catching anything isn't the end of the story. A man appears on the lake shore as dawn is breaking. He offers them a bit of advice from his vantage point, telling them to throw their nets on the other side of the boat. Having nothing else to lose, the disciples do so, not recognizing who this stranger is. And suddenly... Suddenly they find themselves in the midst of this miraculous catch. There are so many fish, we're told, that they can't even haul the net back into the boat. And it's at that moment that John recognized that this stranger can only be Jesus. The miraculous catch brings some level of recognition for him. Perhaps it was a reminder of that day when a couple of fish fed 5,000. Or maybe somehow it reminded him of the day when he left his own nets to follow Jesus and said, as Jesus told him, I will make you fishers of men. Whatever it was, he joyfully shouts, it is the Lord. Peter finally gets it. And as he hears the good news, he suddenly knows what he has to do. Peter grabs his tunic and dives into the water, presumably, presumably because he simply could not wait a moment longer to see and greet his Lord and Master. And because in that joyful and heartwarming moment, he knew that he was no longer forgotten or forsaken. 
Now, I mentioned John Wesley's story a little earlier and the period of frustration and uncertainty in his life when he considered leaving the ministry, when the haunting question, what now, hung over his life. But that wasn't the end of his story either. For on May 24th, 1738, he experienced a change. That evening, he attended a meeting in Aldersgate. And while he was there, he heard a reading from Luther's work on Romans, describing a change within. And Wesley said it was at that moment that he felt his heart strangely warmed. And with fresh clarity, he knew what was his to do. And he went on to lead one of the most remarkable movements of renewal in England, spreading scriptural holiness throughout all the land. He let down his net on the other side of the boat, as it were. And what a miraculous catch was his. As John Wesley found his heart strangely warmed and his sense of purpose restored, so in a similar way, Peter and all the disciples found themselves caught up in something beyond their imagining with this miraculous catch of fish. It was in their old life that new life was found. And so it can be for us. As with the disciples, the familiar places and activities of our lives can become a site of glorious resurrection and glorious new life. As the risen Christ shows up with the invitation for us to do our lives in a different way, to cast our nets on the other side. But there remains a question. So Christ invites us to do life in a new way. To live into this resurrection and become this Easter people. But what exactly does that mean? Well, for the disciples, casting their nets on the other side meant a simple act of trusting obedience. To do whatever it was that Jesus was saying and not to get stuck in their old and familiar ways. All of us at some time or another, find ourselves in places where we are simply going through the motions, where excitement has abated and we aren't sure which direction to go in order to move forward. Unsure of where to go or what to do, we simply stay put, hang back, and continue doing the same old things that we've always done in the same old routine, the same familiar methods. But hear the good news. In those what now moments, Jesus shows up and asks us to cast our net on the other side of the boat, inviting us to something new that we might discover and experience in a greater way than we had ever expected. This is not true. This is true, not just for us as individuals, but also for us as a church? Where are we simply going through the motions as a church? Where might God be asking us to cast our nets on the other side of the boat? And can we trust in a call from a stranger inviting us to cast that net? This simple act of trusting Obedience can make all the difference in the world and can thrust us into a place of participation in the miraculous work of the kingdom. What would it look like if we as a church were to put our trust in God and cast our nets on the other side of the boat? What would the results be? Across the conference today, there is an effort called Imagine No Malaria that every church is participating in. And this effort is, is a chance, is an opportunity to participate in helping to eradicate malaria in Africa. Imagine No Malaria is a chance 
for us to participate by helping out buying nets that can be sent over to families in affected areas of the world. Mosquito nets that are placed over the beds. These nets help reduce rates of malaria. With time, it could potentially eradicate it. It's one way that the church as a whole, the United Methodist Church in Florida, is attempting to cast their net on the other side of the boat to help out those in greatest need. Closer to home. Another possibility surely has to do with the portico. This bold new initiative in which we as a church are daring to cast our nets on the other side. On the other side of the river. On the other side of the city. On the other side of what we have assumed and understood church to be. Imagine, if you will, all of those who might get caught up in the net of God's love and grace through our trusting obedience to this call of Christ. Imagine how your life and mine might be changed through our bold participation in what God is already doing as we step into what it means to be one church with two campuses. But those are just two examples. There are others. And so today, we are all invited to ponder this one simple question. Justin posed it to us at the beginning of the service. I'll ask you again. Imagine this church's nets being filled. What would that look like for you? As you think about that, you've been given those cards to fill out your answer. As you write your response on that piece of card that you have received, may it be a sign of your willingness to take a step of trusting obedience for whatever it is that Christ is calling you to do. And if you find yourself in that what now place of frustration or uncertainty in your life, may this moment open for you a greater sense for the purpose that is yours. And as we stand in light of Easter, remember, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Friends, as you're filling those cards out, when we take up our offering, you can place them in the the offering plate. But for right now, as you fill them out, I will offer a prayer part of the prayer, I will lift up some of the fears that you mentioned last week as a result of that sermon. Those prayers are symbolized up there. Also, it's been on the screen, that image of Jesus is made up of the words that you filled out on those cards. But let us pray in this time. God of victory over death, your son revealed himself again and again and convinced his followers of his glorious resurrection, grant that we may know his risen presence, in love, obediently feed his sheep, and care for the lambs of his flock, until we join the hosts of heaven in worshiping you and praising him, who is worthy of blessing and honor, glory and power. God, in this time and moment, we lift up our own fears Fears of loneliness, embarrassment, disloyalty, disease, and unkindness. Send your Holy Spirit upon us when we feel trapped, ridiculed, inadequate, when we feel a a failure. Break us of our comfort of current habits. Give us strength to face the fears of that assail us. Lord, save us from ourselves. We continue to do the same things over and over, expecting different results. Save us from doing too much. We go fishing every day, not not noticing you waiting with a meal on the beach. Save us from doing too little. We say we love you, and yet so often we neglect your sheep. Save us from ourselves. Help us to hear and respond when you invite us to cast our nets on the other side of the boat. 
We pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, let us continue to worship by giving thanks to God and giving of our tithe and our offering.
Christ calls out to us, inviting us to cast our nets to the other side of the boat, inviting us into a miraculous new way of life. And we are invited to this table where we can find that new life, to celebrate communion together in the breaking of bread and in the sharing of the cup. So I invite you to prepare your hearts now as we gather around this table. Let us enter into a time, into a time of communion. The words and responses will be, pre- will be on the screen in front of you. And so I say to you, friends, the Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image, breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity to slavery and death and made with us a new covenant And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead. Once we were no people, but now we are your people Declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When the Lord ascended, he promised to be with us always through the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim that great mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. We pray all of this in your precious Son's name, as we pray the way he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the good news. This table is open for you. The meal has been prepared and all are welcome. In the United Methodist Church, we serve and celebrate communion at an open table. You don't need to be a member here of the United Methodist Church. 
simply one who has heard that call to cast the net on the other side of the boat. In just a few moments, you'll be invited to come up to one of two stations, one on your right and one on your left. As you come up, you'll be given a piece of bread that you can take and dip into the chalice, after which return to your seats and sit in silence and prayer and meditation, listening for the voice and call of God in your own life. If you have need of it, we also have gluten-free elements that will be available here at this communion table. I'd invite those who are serving to come forward at this time, and as they do, know that you are welcome here.
Receive the benediction. I don't know where God is calling you to lower your nets and let God fill that. But bow your heads and receive this knowing that God is with you. God will be with you as you lower your nets on the other side. Whether you've been feeling empty in your life, God will fill you. Go now with that knowledge that you are forgiven and called to lower your nets and be the people that you've been called to be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.